going? Um, so our theme song today popped into my head like right before class um, is Night Swimming by R.E.M. Do people still call it like swimming in the library, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thought there might be some night swimming going on in the last couple of weeks. Oh. Okay. Um, so office hours, we've got two more office hours. We had a workshop, it was really productive yesterday. That's, that's posted on, um, on Blackboard and then YouTube. Um, office hours tomorrow, or I guess today, three to four. That's a little different than normal. We got booted out of our room, so, um, or at least for a little while. And then uh, tomorrow morning, 11 to 12. If you're gonna have email questions, try to have those in by tomorrow afternoon. I'm probably gonna try to wrap that. I think I have, I, I have day plans, honestly, with my wife um, tomorrow night. So I'm not gonna see emails um, in the evening. So. Gotta keep the romance alive. All right, so uh, chatty, chatty. This is exam, I'm gonna have to talk about exam things. Is that, okay. So. Exam things. Um, if you've looked at the practice exams, there are three spectroscopy problems on there, and that's a lot in my opinion. Um, I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with uh, half of the exam basically being spectroscopy problems like that. So um, what we're going to have on our exam is instead of three, we're going to have two. And so that's going to bump those down closer to about a quarter of the points. I guess probably about 60 um, points total. But I, I'm more comfortable with it being a quarter than it's almost a half. So um, Another thing, so I've had this pointed out to me. So when, as it comes, when we talk about allylic halogenations, And so specifically, uh, when we talk about major versus minor products, so many of you know I hate the book, and so I haven't looked at the book in like two months. Um, I, I've also never taught radicals, and so I actually got this backwards. Um, so the, the moral of the story is don't worry about major versus minor products when it comes to allylic halogenations on the exam. What I'm a lot more likely to ask you is what are the possible products, but I'm not going to ask you to distinguish major versus minor. And uh, no one really does radical reactions, so it's not going to be a big deal and we're going to do or anything. So uh, if that's the worst thing I do this semester, it's, I, think, I think we'll be okay. Um, so let's see. There is homework due when? Yeah, there's homework due tonight. And so this isn't going to be a waste of your time. Um, take advantage of those. It's, it, they're all nucleophilic substitutions. And so that is, that's going to be a, a big chunk of our exam. So uh, you got to do it anyway, and it's best to do it now than after the exam, I guess. And then I'll also try to post some more problems uh, from the book today. Just in, if you want more practice, I'll try to have that available. Okay, so um, I forget what Roman, Roman numeral this is, but we're talking about the other stuff that can help us figure out if we're going S and 2 or, or down the S and 1 pathway. So this is going to lead us to... Roman numeral, letter D, Roman numeral D, uh, D. So we're going to talk about leaving group for a few minutes. And so leaving groups are, are typically good leaving groups because they're stable. Things that are going to separate and, and take electrons with it take a negative charge, and so we need those to be stable with a negative charge. So one thing that we've always seen that is stable with a negative charge is a halogen, right? So that's going to be more specific, or I guess more generically, the conjugate of a strong acid. So it is a strong acid because its conjugate is very stable on its own. And so uh, we started this chapter using alkyl halides as our leaving groups. And so this definitely includes most of those. So we can have uh, iodine or bromine or chlorine. What about fluorine? No, and so we, what we find is that fluorine is actually not going to be a good leaving group, and ultimately it again comes down to stability. So we know I minus is stable, Br minus is stable, Cl minus is stable, but F minus not as stable, and so that's because HF has a pKa of, uh, I forget, it's around three or so, but it's a weak acid, and so clearly F minus is not the conjugate of a strong acid, and so that's why we never use alkyl fluorides as good electrophiles in SN2 or SN1 reactions. Okay, 
Um, so that's good. Halides make good leaving groups, but halides are not ideal. So why not? Halides are gross. Halides can be toxic. Halides are bad for the environment. And so when you hear people talk about um, like companies dumping organic waste, a lot of times that's going to be organic waste with halides. It's not good for the world, and so a lot of time has been spent trying to develop new reactions that don't take advantage of halides because, again, you do this reaction, you end up with lots of halide waste, and then people dump it, and it's, it's not good. So um, one really, really, really common functional group that we've seen some of and you're going to see a lot more of as we get into um, Orgo 2 is going to be the alcohol. All right, so R... OH, and we'll even ask ourselves, what about ROH? Okay, so, um, what do you think? Is OH gonna be a good leaving group? So is it the conjugate of a strong acid? Yeah, let's think about that. So if it is gonna be a good leaving group, what we're gonna have is some sort of reactivity like this, which means we're gonna form OH minus. Now what's the conjugate acid of, o acid of OH minus? It's H2O, and so what's the pKa of H2O? <coughs> it's about 15.7, and so clearly H2O is a weak acid. And so in this case, we're not gonna be able to use alcohols as leaving groups, but um, because there's been a lot of, or at least there's, there's um, potential there, a lot of time has been spent, and so we're gonna learn about two ways to make OH, a good leaving group. All right, it's, it always it has amazed me that um, Orgo 1, they don't really talk about alcohol as much. And so I, I don't know where this is even in the book, but we're going to talk about it for a few minutes because it's certainly important as it comes to SN1, SN2 reactions. All right, so we're going to have two ways to make OH a good leaving group. And so one of our options, the more straightforward option, is going to be to protonate it. All right, so what happens when we protonate an alcohol? So let's say we have, uh, let's see, we use this substrate. So this is gonna be a secondary alcohol. All right, so what, uh, what, what strong halogen acid would you like to use? <coughs> HCl it is, by demand. Okay, so we'll use HCl. So it's a strong acid, so what we're going to do is we're going to protonate our substrate somewhere, and so the only place we have to substrate, or to, to protonate it, is going to be on the oxygen, because those are the only available lone pairs. There's no other lone pairs in there to do anything with. All right, so if we draw this arrow-pushing mechanism of this acid-base reaction, where do we start our, our arrow? At electrons. No one's going to do the opposite. All right, so we start our, our arrows at the electrons, we draw to our proton, and what we're going to end up with is going to be our protonated alcohol. So that now looks like this. So let's think about the logistics of a protonated alcohol. So let's say we have R, O, H. So let's think about... Um, what that's going to be. So when that leaves, we're going to end up with water. Now, what is the conjugate of water? The conjugate acid. H3O plus. That's hydronium. And so hydronium, or H3O plus, has a pKa of what? About minus 1.7. And so does that qualify hydronium to be a strong acid? Yeah, it's below zero, right? And so clearly what we've now got in the form of hydronium is a strong acid. And so essentially, by protonating our alcohol, we have changed the structure such that now we have an OH2 plus whose conjugate is H3O plus. And so that's a strong acid. And so now we find that this is essentially a good leaving group. And so what we've got up here is we're going to treat it just as such. Now, one of the downsides to this, and so we'll mark, we'll mark downsides in blue, SN1. <laughs> is encouraged. And so just going, protonating an alcohol is going to encourage an SN1 type mechanism, which is one of the downsides to using protonation as our, as our method of converting the OH to a good leaving group. 
All right, so that's no good, but um, it still allows us to make a good leaving group. And so that means we're going to go through a carbocation intermediate, knowing what we know about SN1 mechanisms. And so then, all right, we've got a carbocation mechanism, and so the next step is going to be reaction with a nucleophile. Now, do we, what's a possible nucleophile that we should have in solution right now? Water, but if we attacked it with water, would we have essentially do anything? It wouldn't be a productive pathway. We'd just get back to our starting material. What else? Yeah, we've also created some chloride right back at the first step, right? So we produce chloride essentially in that first protonation step, and so the chloride didn't go anywhere. So now what we have is attack of the carbocation from both sides. And so what we're gonna end up with is chlorine added here. All right, so we'll have this product. So is this the uh, is this the retention or the inversion product? Yeah. So if we have our, our leaving group here on the right side, and now our nucleophile is on the left side and has pushed everything over, have we gone through an inversion? Yeah, definitely. So here we've got our inversion product. Of course, we could also have plus what? Yeah, we could have plus an enantiomer. So that would be our retention product. And so these two things together would form what? Yeah, so this would be a racemic mixture. All right, so that's a possibility. We can protonate our alcohol. Chances are we'll go through an SN1 mechanism, which isn't ideal because um, we have a racemic mixture that can form. What else can happen if we go through an SN1 mechanism? Yeah, we can do shifts, right? So if we have carbocations, we can also do 1,2 hydride or 1,2 alkyl shifts, and so that's kind of a downside as well. So let's see. Um, the positives to protonating, we'll say that it is easy. You just toss some acid in. It's cheap, so HCl or any of the strong halogen acids are, are really, really, really cheap chemicals. We have a built-in nucleophile. Right, so our acid, which was HCl, we had a nucleophile right in there that would later go on and, and um, do this final step up here. But the big downside is that protonating encourages an SN1 mechanism. And so in this case, we can end up with multiple products. And we can also see one, two, Shifts. And so ultimately, it's, it's not often that ideal to use the protonation strategy to form a, a good leaving group. Okay, so uh, fortunately, we have better ways to do it. And so the second way that we can form a, a good leaving group from OH is essentially going to be to turn OH into something like this structure. All right, so who, who recognizes maybe this structure right here? <coughs> this is the conjugate of this molecule. And so if this is a leaving group, we're going to end up with a conjugate <coughs> that looks like that. So what is this molecule right here? Yeah, so this is H2SO4. This is sulfuric acid. And so is sulfuric acid a strong acid or a weak acid? It is a strong acid for sure. And so when we look back at this, uh, this group right here, have we converted our alcohol into the conjugate of a strong acid? Yeah, sure, that is definitely gonna be the conjugate of a strong acid. So now we've got the conjugate of our strong acid. And so that makes this a good leaving group. And most importantly, we can do SN2 with this type, of, um, this type of functionality. All right, now we're often doing organic reactions in organic solvent, and organic solvents are typically fairly nonpolar, and so a, a very polar molecule like sulfuric acid, we find often won't dissolve well in organic solvents. So what we do is we basically take sulfuric acid and we make it kind of organic-y, and the way that we do that 
is we're going to keep the oxygen, the hydrogen, we'll keep the sulfur and its double bonds to oxygen. But now on the right side, what we're going to do is we're going to add some organic stuff. So we add a benzene ring and a methyl group. And so essentially now half of our molecule and the majority of our atoms are very, very, very organic-y. And so now we've got a, a much, much better possibility of this dissolving in an organic solvent. However, uh, it's still going to be very strong acid, so it's still very strong acid. It's just more organic. And so what we call this structure is tosylic acid, which you will often see shortened to TSOH. And so if you ever see TSOH, it's basically an analog of sulfuric acid that has some organic junk stuck on the end. That's, that's the difference. All right. So let's see how this can, uh, this can possibly work to help us out. So for example, what we can do is we can have some alcohol, such as this right here. Now what kind of carbon, what kind of uh, carbon is our alcohol connected to? That is a secondary. Can we do SN2 in a secondary? Sure, and so that's, that's kind of going to be the goal here, is to, to undergo a transformation um, at this, at, in an SN2 fashion at this secondary carbon. All right, so you're not going to be responsible for this mechanism. I just want to show you how we get from, uh, from one to the other. And so what we're going to do is we're not going to use tosylic acid because we're not going to be able to react that with an alcohol. So actually, what we're going to use is tosyl chloride. And so that's the key part that you need to have, uh, have an idea of. You just need to be familiar with TSCl, tosyl chloride. And so what that is, is it's a way that we can more or less stick our tosyl group onto our alcohol. We also have to make sure that we use a nitrogen base. And so something like trimethylamine is perfectly fine for this. All right, so again, you're not responsible for the mechanism, but I just want to give you a heads up of kind of what's going on behind the scenes. And so this is sort of a concerted type mechanism. So our nitrogen base is going to go in and, and kind of deprotonate our alcohol. And so at the same time, our alcohol is increasing in nucleophilicity and it attacks the sulfur right there. And so what we end up with after all these arrows are done, like I said, I'll say it one more time, you do not need to be able to draw this mechanism. What we're going to end up with, boo. Which one are we going to do? Pick reload page or recover copy? Recover, recover. recover copy? I mean, I just did this lecture, right? So it's not a huge deal. Uh, we'll just copy paste. We were about right here. Yay. Okay, uh, this might have some slight differences from what we just did. Um, <laughs> okay, so what we're essentially going to do is we're going to end up with a product that looks as such on the right. That's what I was in the process of drawing. And so you don't even need to really know this. Here's what you need to know is that essentially we have been able to change our alcohol over here into this structure. It's still an oxygen, but now we just say OTS. And so that's what basically all this junk is. That's our OTS over there. All right, so that is awesome because here we now have a good leaving group. But it's not so good that we're going to encourage SN1 reactivity. And so what we can do is SN2. And good for us. All right, so for example, what you could see is let's say we have a starting alcohol that looks like this. And so we, we've been given a test. We've got to synthesize a really important drug. And so our really important drug has an S-methyl group in its place. Now, we don't want to form a racemic mixture of this because, you know, we are chiral beings and we want only this on a dash here. So we've got to come up with a strategy. Are we going to protonate or are we going to tosylate? Well, first off, is this the inversion or the retention product? It's the inversion product. And so we only want to do what? SN2 or SN1? 
we really, 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 really want to do SN2 so that we get that inversion product. And so can we protonate to get solely the inversion product? No, we're going to have to tosylate. So what do we react with our alcohol? Tosyl chloride, amine base. All right, that's all we've got to do. And so essentially what that does is that turns our alcohol we didn't change anything about the chiral center. We did no reactivity of the carbon-oxygen bond, and so it stays on a wedge. And so we end up with OTS. And so now it's your job to convert this OTS into this S-methyl. And so, let's see, what is the nucleophile? What does the nucleophile need to be? Well, clearly, what's the atom that, that we're forming a new bond here with? That is sulfur, and so we definitely need sulfur, and so we need a methyl as well. Now, one way that we can ensure that we have a strong nucleophilic sulfur is by having a negatively charged sulfur. Can we ever just add an anion to our mixture? We've got to have what? We've got to have a counter ion, so what's your favorite counter ion? Sodium's a good one. So in this case, we'll use sodium. You don't have to use sodium. There's multiple right answers. You can use lithium or potassium or rubidium. Don't use the blue ones. Blue ones are bad. So stay above, stay away, stay above row five here. But basically, you can have different answers. Um, we don't even have to have a negatively charged sulfur. So did we learn that a neutral sulfur is a good nucleophile? Sure. And so we could also have, say, this thiol. This would also be a good nucleophile. So in this sort of case, there's multiple right answers. So you just got to come up with one way that we can go from this to this. And so either of these will encourage an S and two reaction, and we can get just the inversion product as shown. Alright, um, a little more about alcohols, so let's see, let's say we have ethanol, and so we reacted with this, and so what's the goal always when we're doing a nucleophilic substitution? We want to do which one? SN2, so we're looking for reasons to do SN2, what kind of alcohol halide do we have? Primary, secondary, tertiary. Right there, what's that carbon? That's a primary carbon, right? So we have a primary halide right there. So can we do SN2? Yeah, that's good. So SN2, check mark. What about ethanol? Is that a good nucleophile? Yeah, re really, what did we only make a list of for the weak nucleophiles? Neutral oxygen. Anytime you see neutral oxygen, it's not a good nucleophile. So here we have a weak nucleophile. And so can a weak nucleophile do SN2? At least shake your head. Okay. All right, so in this case, SN2 is no good. So we can't do SN2. So what's the only other possibility? We could try to do SN1. Now when we look back here, at our alkyl halide that's a primary. Can we do SN1 at a primary alkyl halide? We can. So what we find is a situation where SN1 is no good. And so ultimately, what we're going to see here is nothing. We get no reaction. But what if we really, 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 really want to do this reaction? We've got to come up with another strategy. And so what we're going to do, how can we make that oxygen into a good nucleophile? Yeah, if we deprotonate the oxygen, that's going to put a negative charge on the oxygen, and now we've got an awesome nucleophile. So let's see. We want to use, if we have OH, what are we going to want to react with it? What type of, of, react, of reagent? We want a really, 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 really strong base. And so if we have a really strong base, what we can do is an acid-base reaction and deprotonated as such. And so by deprotonating, what we're going to end up with is methoxide. So here, we have a weak nucleophile. What about over here on the right side? Is this weak or strong? This is very much a strong nucleophile. And so what we're finding, because honestly, alcohols are one of the most common nucleophiles that you're going to see, but they're not strong unless we deprotonate. So a lot of a lot of time is spent in the lab basically deprotonating an alcohol to turn it into a good nucleophile. And so at this point, once we've deprotonated, we have a strong nucleophile, so we can toss in our alkyl halide. 
And so in effect, can we now do our SM2 reaction? Yes. Yeah, we now have a strong nucleophile. And so we end up with that product right there. All right, so we can influence this a little bit. Yeah? Um, why not? Like, why don't you put it? Um, so because we're reacting with a really strong base, right? And so a really strong base is going to be a, a proton acceptor. And so that means that the alcohol is going to act as a proton donor, and it's going to donate its proton. If we protonated it, remember, do we, do, if we want to protonate it, do we treat it with an acid or a base? We treat it with an acid. In this case, we're treating it with a base. And so alcohol is going to have this dual nature. If you protonate it, you can turn it into a good leaving group. If you deprotonate it, you can turn it into a good nucleophile. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. One more thing. So let's say we've got... Something that looks like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to treat it with our really, really, really strong base. <coughs> All right, so is there a proton that's going to be fairly acidic? What's going to be the most acidic proton on this structure? It should be the OH, right? And so what's going to happen is we're going to deprotonate the hydrogen. So what we'll end up with is this right here. All right, so we've got negative charge on this oxygen. All right, so do we have an alkyl halide? Do we have an sp3 hybridized carbon bound to a halogen? Yep. Yeah, we do, right? So we've got an alkyl halide, and so at this position, we have a primary. Now, we haven't seen this sort of thing before. Every, every time we've done this, we've had a discrete separate nucleophile reacting with a discrete separate electrophile. But that's not a necessary um, aspect of, of nucleophilic substitution. <laughs> so this is actually fairly common. And in reality, this reaction is a lot easier to do than an internal molecular where we have two separate things. Can anyone think of a reason why this is going to be pretty easy to, to do? So when we're doing an internal molecular reaction, we have to have stuff eventually bump together, right? We've got to have it come together at some point. So there's an entropic uh, nature, there, an entropic factor that's necessary. Entropy is, is going to have to be on our side, and we're going to have to bump our stuff together at some point. Do we ever have to bump these together? I mean, they're pretty much tethered to a benzene, right? They're stuck together. And so this is going to be a really, really, really easy reaction to take place. And so again, we just want to think, can we do SN2? Can we do SN2 at a primary alkyl halide? Sure. Do we have a strong nucleophile? Yeah, right here. We have our oxygen. That is a strong nucleophile. And so nothing's going to change about the mechanism. All you got to keep track of is where your arrows are going. So we're going to start our arrow where? Electrons of the nucleophile, so we're going to draw them to the carbon connected to the leaving group, and so our leaving group will go away. And so eventually what's going to happen is we're going to end up with a structure that looks like this. And so for proof, we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, and over here you can see we've got one, two, three, four, Five, six. So we've seen some ring opening type things this in, in Orgo 1 this semester. Now we can see that if we do an intramolecular type of nucleophilic substitution, we can actually now form a ring. So we had a ring here, and now we have um, a second ring connect, uh, connected to it. So don't be confused if you see something intramolecular like this. The same, same rules apply. All right, so I don't even, I don't even remember what Roman numeral we're on right now. Um, but it's all these other considerations for SN1, SN2 reactions. And so this leads us to our final letter, which is E. And so that's going to be, uh, that's going to have to do with solvent. <laughs> okay, so when we're doing nucleophilic substitutions, we're going to consider two types of solvent. And so they're both typically polar. So we're going to have two types for SN reactions. So our two types are going to be polar protic 
And so specifically, when we talk about a protic solvent, what that means is that it contains either an OH or an NH proton. What's different about OH and NH protons versus a CH proton? What kind of really, really strong intermolecular force can take place with these? So these right here can do hydrogen bonding. And so that's going to be the really big difference that we'll see. All right, so we've got an OH or an NH somewhere on our, uh, on our solvent. We're able to do hydrogen bonding. And that's going to impact what we see later down the road is the strength of our nucleophile. The alternative is uh, we don't have those bonds. So in this case, what we call that is a polar aprotic solvent. So that will be uh, no OH or NH protons. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and spoil it for you. So whenever we use a polar aprotic solvent, we're going to be encouraging an SN2 reaction. And so that means anytime that we use a polar protic solvent, we're going to be encouraging an SN1 reaction. So we're going to talk about why that is for a few minutes. It's kind of an interesting reason. All right, so let's make two lists. On the left side, we're going to make a polar aprotic list. And so we're going to, that's going to be the one we focus a little more on just because we always want to do SN2, and so it's with polar aprotic that we actually can do SN2. Over here, we're going to discuss polar protic solvents. And of course, that is our SN1 possibility. All right, so some common, uh, some common solvents on the polar aprotic side would be things like acetone. So you don't need to necessarily know these structures, um, but you do need to remember that they're polar aprotic solvents. Another common one is acetonitrile. And so that's a methyl group attached to a cyanide group. So methyl and then C in there. Uh, DMF, which is dimethylformamide. So that looks like this. And again, you can see in all of these solvents, in all of these aprotic solvents, there are no OH or NH bonds. And then finally, DMSO is really, really, really polar. And so it looks like that. All right, so these are common polar aprotic solvents. On the polar protic solvents, side, we're not going to include as much detail about them just because, again, we're just usually trying to do SN2 reactions. So obviously something like methanol is going to be a polar protic solvent. We clearly have an OH bond. It also is going to include the solvent of life, water. And so anytime you use water, we're going to have a polar protic solvent. We do have OH bonds in that case. And we'll just leave it at that. So really, anytime you see an OH or an NH bond in something, you know that it's polar protic. Okay, so let's think about um, let's think about a nucleophile, and so we're going to use a chlorine nucleophile in both cases. So let's go ahead. We're going to draw a picture. So here's our chlorine in our polar protic solvent, and over here we're going to have our chlorine in our aprotic solvent. Now, when we think about the structure of water. Water looks like this, and there's significant dipoles in the direction of the oxygen. So what we end up with is a partial positive, a partial positive, and then a partial negative. All right, so our nucleophile is negatively charged. So which, which part of the water is going to interact with the chloride? It's going to be the hydrogens, right? Because we have a partial positive charge, and so they're going to interact in a hydrogen bond with the electron density of the chloride. And so we can just draw that with a dotted line. Is that a full sigma bond, a hydrogen bond? It's not. And so in fact, this is just a really, 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 really strong intermolecular force or interaction. Intermolecular uh, interaction. It's not a real sigma bond or anything. It's not permanent, but it definitely exists. And so all around this chlorine, we're going to find that we have waters attracted to the electrons. And so we end up with essentially what we can refer to as a solvent cage. All right, so we have our chloride floating around in our water. And more or less, the chlorine is kind of stuck 
and surrounded in a solvent cage. And so do you think with all this, this polar protic solvent around the chloride, do you think it's going to be uh, easier or harder for the chloride to act as a nucleophile? Do, do you think this is, is this going to be a stabilizing or a destabilizing interaction up here? It's definitely stabilizing. Right? It wouldn't happen if it weren't thermodynamically favorable. So this is a very stable interaction. So for this chlorine to go out and act as a nucleophile, basically it's got to break out of the solid cage, right? It has this water that's attracted to it and it's surrounding it, and so it's going to break out. And so what that means is it's going to be harder for our chloride to be a strong nucleophile. It's more or less, it's less available to act as a nucleophile because it's surrounded by the water. And so it's for that reason that we end up seeing a polar protic solvent encouraging an SN1 reaction. We know we need a strong nucleophile for an SN2 reaction. And so in this case, we have a chloride that even if it is a good nucleophile, it's sequestered, it's surrounded, it's harder for it to be a good nucleophile. And so this is going to discourage it to be a good nucleophile, and we end up seeing a polar protic solvent favor, SN1. All right, so then on the other side, for the polar aprotic example, we can use, uh, we use acetone. And so acetone, can, it, can acetone do any uh, hydrogen bonding? It can't, and it can't do hydrogen bonding, at least not with a nucleophile, because it doesn't have any OH or NH bonds. And so what we find is that with a polar aprotic solvent, there is no solvent cage. And so our chlorine is free to be a strong nucleophile. I think that uh, I think the construction is supposed to be done like right around the end of classes, which is just perfect. <laughs> okay, now it's funny. That, so when we've taken the exams, usually the, the noise isn't too bad. I can't remember if it's this section or the ten o'clock section, but in both sections they've decided to just like drill a ten foot hole into the ground right outside of the door. So that is unfortunate. All right. So um, in this case, if our chloride is free to act as a strong nucleophile, that's going to obviously encourage SN2. And so really, sol the choice of solvent, it's, it's kind of overlooked, but it ends up having a pretty huge impact on, on reactivity. And you'll see more about that down the road as you go. What we can also say is uh, also, SN1 prefers very polar solvent. Did anyone think about why an SN1 reaction would be favored by a very polar solvent? Yeah. Yeah, so what about that intermediate that an SN1 reaction goes through? Is it charged? Yeah, it's a carbocation, right? And so if we have a very, very, very charged polar co uh, carbocation, that's obviously going to be stabilized by a very, very, very polar solvent. And so ultimately, we have a... Uh, very polar carbocation, which can be stabilized, stayed, stabilized in a very polar solvent. <coughs> okay, um, that pretty much is it, I think. Uh, so we've got two choices. We've got 10 minutes left. We can either do maybe some exam review or we can start on the new material. The new material? I mean, we can, we can do that, uh, but I feel like it might serve us better to, to maybe do a little exam review. While I love the enthusiasm, let's, uh, let's actually do a little bit of exam review, I think. So, let's see. Uh, All right. 
our nucleophilic reactivity is on the carbon there. So that's what our sodium cyanide salt looks like. So we do have a strong nucleophile, so that's good. And then our solvent, we're told, is acetone. And typically, you're going to see solvent written on the bottom. All right, so if solvent is acetone, is that polar protic or aprotic? It's, it's aprotic. Can we do SN2? Yeah, we're good to go for SN2, right? So that's what we're going to do. So here we have a polar aprotic solvent. And so what we're going to end up with is an SN2 <coughs> reaction. And so we want to make sure that we have the inversion product, which is going to put our cyanide on a dash there. All right. Yeah, I bet, I bet you guys actually hear the construction <coughs> a lot more than I do. I feel like I'm in my own world down here. All right, um, so then let's see. What if we had this substrate, and so we reacted it with methanol. Okay, so again, the goal is SN2. Now, do we have a good leaving group? Yeah, we do have a good leaving group. What kind of carbon is it connected to? It's a tertiary. Can we do SN2 at a tertiary? We can. We'll say no SN2. And so that forces us to think about SN1. All right, so we look over at our nucleophile. And even if this weren't tertiary, do we have a good nucleophile? No, so we've got a weak nucleophile. So pretty much we're looking to do some SN2. If we can't do SN2, we have to see maybe excuse me, if we can do SN1. All right, so we've got a tertiary, which definitely is favored by SN1, and then we have a weak nucleophile, and we can do SN1 with that. All right, so, and importantly, the solvent in this reaction is methanol, and so is the nucleophile. What do we call that type of reaction? So that is a solvolysis. So if you ever see um, something where you've just got something, methanol in there. Basically what we're doing is we're taking our bromide, we're going to stick it in methanol. Methanol is our solvent. Methanol is also our nucleophile, and so we call that a solvolysis reaction. What we're going to find is this is definitely going to be an SN1. So how many products will we get? Yeah, we'll end up with two. So we'll end up with the inversion product. Which looks like this plus what? Yeah, it'll be plus enantiomer. And so what we have is uh, that's our inversion. And so the enantiomer would be the retention product. All right. Um, let's see. So what we're going through is a carbocation, and so our methanol is going to add to our carbocation, which means we're going to end up with an intermediate at some point. that looks like this. Now, do we ever want to show a charged intermediate as our product? No. And so how do we go from that to that? Base. Yeah, so we want to make sure we add a base. We know that our oxygen is positively charged. So we add a base with its electrons, and so we will deprotonate. And by deprotonating, we're able to get back to our neutral product up here. All right, um, let's see. Let's 
let's do... Take a look at this one. So in this case, we're going to chloride and let's react it with water. So this is going to be another solvolysis reaction. We've just got water in there. Water is going to be our nucleophile and our, uh, and our solvent. And so furthermore, we're going to make our substrate look like that. So we always want to do SN2. So what kind of carbon do we have? That's a primary, right? Can we do SN2? Sure. What about our solvent? Is it strong or weak? Yeah, so we've got a weak nucleophile. Can we do SN2? No, that is, that is no good. We'll say, we'll put an X next to SN2. So now we've got to think about SN1 <coughs> possibilities. We look back at our alkyl halide. Can we do an SN1 reaction at a primary alkyl halide? We can't. Is there anything that might make us able to do SN1 in this case? And so reality, it is a primary carbon, but it is also an allylic halide. And so because it's an allylic halide, are we able to do SN1 and an allylic halide? Yeah, so SN1 is perfectly fine. And the reason for that is we're going to go through a carbocation intermediate. It looks like this. And so what's the more important resonance contributor? All right, so what's the difference? We have a primary and a secondary carbocation. What's more stable? Secondary. And so this is going to be our major contributor. And so that also means that this is going to lead to our major product. So anytime we have this sort of, this sort of resonance stabilized cation, we've got multiple carbons with cation-like reactivity. And so this is our major contributor. So what we're going to find is we're going to form products from here. And so since we're using H2O, that's going to form an alcohol. So what we'll end up with is this alcohol plus Yeah, so there's only one chiral center, and so we could also have the enantiomer, which would have the OH on a dash. And then we can also have reactivity at the other carbon, which will give us a product that looks like this. And so what would be the major products? Yeah, the major products are going to result from the major resonance contributor. So this is just a more stable carbocation, so it's going to have more positive charge buildup. The primary will have less positive charge buildup, and so we end up with this as the minor. Any last questions? All right, so office hours today and tomorrow. Like I said, I'm, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to answer emails tomorrow evening, so get them in as early as you can. Oh, and one more thing regarding the exam. I said this to, to 10 o'clock. I want to make sure I say it to 11 o'clock. There's not a ton on solvent in SN2, SN1 on the exam. So just a heads up there.